I don't know. I hadn't a clue what Paris were, but they were the smartest-looking troops. High brown boots, maroon berets, and uh, they looked good. And I said, anybody that can look that good, that's for me. So <laughs> I joined the Paris. I guess we felt because we were different from the rest of the army that we were strong to use the word special, but it, it, it's probably true. We, we were different uh, and we felt it. And we felt a, a sense of pride. We were trained and, and we were so confident uh, of ourselves. I mean, there, there was no way that nobody could, could touch us really. You know, the, the, we weren't afraid of anything. Daredevils gets ready to jump. Their job is to act as shock troops, capture an airfield, seize a position, or disrupt communications in the rear of the enemy. Yes, they're tough, mighty tough, and the best. I was with the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion. I'm originally from Moncton, New Brunswick. Toronto. I was one of the rare breeds that was born and raised in Toronto. And in the East End. Mm -hmm. Oh, a little village out in Saskatchewan called Lashburn. Yeah, that's about maybe 300 people. Well, in Junction, farming community. I, as a farm boy, didn't know anything about military history, had nothing. Farming, that's about it. I'd led a rather sheltered life in Toronto, and the, the joy to me was that for the first time I was dealing with men from British Columbia, from Alberta, from Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and right to the, to the Maritimes. The U.S. for volunteers to go airborne, and 20 of us volunteered, but uh, they cut it right down to six of us. 41 volu volunteered, uh, but only two were accepted. And they put you through physical tests and mental examinations to determine if recognizing that you were a paratrooper and could be dropped behind the lines, whether you had enough independence of knowledge and spirit to be able to survive on your own. They were looking for some brain power, but the main thing was, was physical drive and initiative. And they, they had all kinds of ways of measuring it. Psychologists would put together a, a, a series of questions and so on about your mother and father and your, particularly your family background. Stupid questions, you know, all, did you pee to bed? You know, what, what's that got to do with it, you know? So when he finished with me, he said, you would make a good paratrooper. I said, that sounds good. And I didn't know what, you know, what the paratrooper was even. Uh, I soon found out. From the time you got up in the morning until you went to bed at night, you trained, that's it. Constantly, 24 hours a day. Toughest part? Yeah. I don't think there was any easy part to it, you know? I was fortunate because working on a farm, my legs were strong. One time I yawned during a lecture and they, they made me do 50 push-ups during the break. It was ridiculous, like, you know. You could do 15 miles on the hot prairie sun and the sergeant say, hey, why don't you go over there in the truck and get some water? And if you did, you'd be out. When you get to the point where you're doing jumps off the tower, you'd hear people in the, in the hut there screaming at night, just having nightmares. You know, they, they didn't like that. That was worse than jumping in a plane, I think. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. From the Battle of Trafalgar and the Revolutionary Era, right through to the Second World War, if you are looking for your next military history fix, then this is the service for you. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial 
and War Stories fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code WARSTORIES at checkout. First time I was up in an airplane, they had to jump out of it. After the first one, the second one was the worst because you knew what was coming. There was an aperture, a three-foot aperture in the floor. When you push off, make sure you're trying to hit the center of the hole and look up with all you do, don't look down. The natural thing to do, everyone, is to look down. But if you look down, your face is going to hit the other side of the, of the what they call ring the bell. That was it, you're going to ring the bell. Lots of broken noses and bleeding noses. You'd hit your nose on the other side, and me with my big nose is it, quite possible. No, we didn't have reserve chutes in England. Your temper was so low, you wouldn't have time to use a second chute. The British didn't believe in the reserve. Number one, it took up too much room on the pack. The space could be better used for weapons and equipment. So the Canadians were a little shocked to only get one. When you jump out, all this noise is gone. All you hear is the wind. And we come in fairly fast onto the ground, onto the drop zone. And I hurt my legs a little bit, but I was too stupid to say anything. Because if you did, they kicked you out. I saw two or three that didn't open in training. You know. A couple of days after, you may go over to see where they landed, and all you could see was an indentation in the ground where they hit the ground. That's it. But they covered it up pretty good. And after the first day, you didn't talk about it at all. I was given my wings, and it was a sense of considerable joy and pleasure then I was now joining this special group, the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion. And the pride of that unit to never let anybody down. When somebody says, this is the mission, this is the target, you go, that's it. There's nothing you could do to hold them back. June 6th, 1944, and the greatest armada in military history is assembled in England for an assault on Hitler's fortress Europe. The Allied forces have nearly three million troops trained for the assault. We were going into Normandy. That was the, the objective on D-Day. Our mission was to go in ahead of the beaches. We were given the area around Varaville, about 20 miles in from the beach, to establish a defensive position to destroy bridges, to take over various crossroads, to destroy every hope of the Germans from reinforcing the troops they already had. To, to stop the counterattack. To stop any counterattack. You are there without support. You fight with whatever you land with, and it's dangerous. They got the word to go. We loaded the plane, and then they headed for the coast. I was most apprehensive about the jump on D-Day because we had not had any experience at jumping in the dark, in the absolute black. And this was going to be a midnight drop. Well, it was awful quiet on the plane. There was nobody talking or nothing. It was just one guy looking at the other. That's about it. Co-pilot coming back and saying, you know, we're three minutes to the drop zone. The red light came on which is stand up and hook up. So everybody stood up and hooked up. So now it's getting pretty serious. We stand up, hook up, check the guys shoot in front, form a line and wait for the green light to come on. Now doing this, we're coming into France. You can see out the window. Now all of a sudden you see fireworks up ahead and then you realize that not fireworks, it's a, a gun shooting. 
some of the planes got shot down, some got bullet holes in them. Just that's all, you see the little holes. They took evasive action. They lost where they were supposed to go. The pilot, to get back to England, he had to get rid of the Paris. So he just put the light on, and we all jumped out. The green light comes on, and the word comes from everywhere, go. I was number one, so you stand at the door. What happened to play went like that, tilted. Anyway, I fell out, and everybody else followed me. I remember I was about six or seven miles away from where I was supposed to be, so I don't know where the other guys landed. Never saw them again. It was the most widely scattered drop in history. Everyone was scattered hells and half acres over miles. And the Germans flooded va vast areas. If a guy landed over a drainage ditch, he went down seven feet, he never come up. So we lost a few that way. When I landed, I landed, I thought at that that was the highest tree in France. And so I'm trying to get out of my parachute, and I can't get out because I'm hanging straight down like this. And then I heard some noise, mumbling, looked like a German patrol to me, below me. They're walking. In fact, some of them pointed up to me. I just still as a will, mouse. And it kept going. Never bothered with me at all for some reason. I could hear somebody walking around. And I figured, holy geez, I, I just got here and they're, they're really looking for me already. Anyway, I hurried up and got my rifle out. And then I heard him, he walked to another tree or a bush, whatever it was. So I said, well, it's gonna be him or me, so I better go after him. So I went to where he'd been, and I waited there, and then he moved again. So I went to the other place where he'd been, and then he didn't move anymore, so I figured, well. So I said, well, this is it. So I went, I went out to, to see if I could get him, and it turned out it was a cow. So I, I, the sweat stopped <laughs> running down my back. And it took hours to finally get two men, three men, four men in a group. We were pretty relieved to be able to see daylight and look around and, you know, I recognized the people I was with, you know. Even though they were not my platoon, they were lost. You just simply said to them, this is the mission, this is the target, let's go. Were you scared? All the time. <laughs> You say you weren't scared, you're lying. You're on your own. Do what you can. If they got through us, they could go right to the beaches. Five hundred warships lay down a withering barrage. And it's the beginning of the end for Hitler's dreams of world conquest. And wave after wave hits the beach. Casualties were heavy in those early hours, but the Allies were on their way to Berlin. The troops were um, targets coming off the boats, and our job was to uh, stop the Germans from coming from the east. Our job was to get the Orange Bridge so that the Germans couldn't cross it. We were blowing bridges on the Dives River. Now, B Company's main mission was to destroy the bridge at Robeholm. The main demolition was to be done by British engineers who were there with us. And uh, they blew the thing, and the whole thing went, crashed into the river. That's it. After the bridges and all the objectives were taken, they were to retreat back to uh, Le Manil, a crossroads 
set up a defense position and prepare for a German attack. We dug in and we fought there at Lemesnil, the crossroads at Lemesnil for over a week. And it was tough. It was the first experience we had with German snipers. They were deadly accurate. You couldn't get up and wander around <laughs> or rattle your mess tin or something because you're, you're as good as dead. I know I had a friend of mine, uh, when he took his helmet off like this. And the first thing you know, he was on the ground dead. A sniper had him right to the head, right in the forehead. He just done. June 12th came along, and the Germans were determined to break through to the beach. 700 German uh, regiment men put in an attack with tank and a, a self-propelled 88 gun. It was the main battle that we had, and it was tough. The adrenaline is flowing like unbelievable. It was some real serious fighting. The main thing is, don't let your buddies down. That's the main thing. So that's what we live for. Three tanks came up, and they were Sherman tanks. We were pretty pleased to, hey, we can't lose now. We got three tanks with us. As the first one came up in front of us, he was just about dead in front of us. And uh, he was turning his turret when he went up in flames. The other one came up behind him, started to turn his turret. He went up in flames. And the third one. So we had three burning tanks in a row. They never fired one shot. It doesn't stick in your mind they're killing people, but in the back of your mind, there is something that's going on that you don't know. Because uh, I was not put this earth to kill people. And it's kind of, but you get, you don't get used to it, you get hardened to it. You know, you know what you have to do, it's either you're going to get killed or he's going to get killed. And I don't want to get killed. The brigadier ordered the signal to the uh, coast that uh, we needed the uh, shelling. And he gave the coordinates. It was quite a satisfaction to hear those Allied shells going overhead because you got to the point that you could identify them pretty quickly. Say, you know, they're ours. They caught the Germans on the open. The whole 700 of them, I don't know how many were killed, but most of them must have got, were caught out in the open by the shelling and took the heart right out of them. It had to be held, but it was done. We did our job. After a few days, we certainly were reinforced by troops from the beaches that came up, and, and that was a big help. Now we were dealing with Hamilton Light Infantry, Essex Scottish, uh, any number, Winnipeg rifles, all kinds of Canadian troops, and that was a great satisfaction that they had landed on the beach successfully and were coming up. And of course, they felt that that we'd been doing some heroic tasks, <laughs> you know, which which was nice to have that that camaraderie. We had 340-some casualties on D-Day, 
from the time we were in there till we come out. That's out of 600 men. Yeah. It was, uh, it was sad, and in some ways shocking, really, that uh, that the drop was responsible for such a loss. And at the other hand, it was quite remarkable that a handful of men dropped in the middle of the night into Normandy, wherever the hell they knew, were able to make their way around to join up with others and finally get to the objective and accomplish it. It's just unbelievable. And that's, that's what happened. If we fail our mission, then I truly believe that the invasion would have been finished. They'd have never made it. But you did fulfill your mission. Yep, every one of them. All the airborne fulfilled their missions. So it's a uh, it's hard hard thing, but. It is, you can talk to a lot of people. If you've not, if you've not been in a war, you don't know what it's like. You know, it's worth a million dollars, but I wouldn't do it for two. When we came back from Normandy, Brigadier Hill gave orders to his battalion commanders. There's got to be greater discipline. There's got to be better fit, physical fitness. There's got to be better weaponage use. Jeff Nicklin was appointed Lieutenant Colonel, and he landed like a ton of bricks. He was out of this world as far as training went, because he was a hard-nosed football player. Oh, he's a tough boy played for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in the Canadian Football League. So that accounts for his uh, athletic uh, ability and perception that we weren't, we, were, we weren't up to his snuff. <laughs> the training became really painful. 10-mile runs with equipment. Then there was 50-mile marches, and it was always done at a run. I can remember bringing my platoon down the road after 10 miles, ran alongside them and encouraged them, you know, there's the gate, keep going, you know. But Nicklin, as we went through the gate, he was taking names of stragglers. They were gone and replaced very quickly. Oh, piddly thing. We had to run around the parade square. We couldn't walk on it. And that was one of the things that the guys hated them for. Nicklin was more respected than he was liked, and the anger was building. The veterans from Normandy felt that they had practically won the war. They had done all the training they needed. They had been blooded, and now was the time to rest. And that was strongly felt by just about every man that, that came back from Normandy. It got on your nerves so bad that we did finally go on strike. What we did was we would form up in platoons and march through the kitchen, right past the food, wash our mess tins in the trough that they had for us, and that was it. We never touched the food. We're just, we're just not eating. We're not eating. We're, you know, we'll do all the training. We'll parade. We'll do everything we're ordered to do as soldiers, but we're not happy. So for three days. 
our men refused breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It gets up to divisional headquarters, and the Brigadier Hill, he heard about it, and he come down. Brigadier Hill was the most outstanding leader, and that was accepted by every paratrooper that I ever knew. He wrote the book on leadership, but he had a special affection for the Canadians. He ordered everybody on the parade square, and he got up on the stage and he gave us a lecture. He just laid down the law and said he had the greatest respect for the Canadians, but discipline was key to survival. We would be going in again with the battalion very soon, and he wanted the men uh, to be, behave like men, behave like soldiers. Go back to work, and he would look after us. And when Brigadier Hill says that, you listen, because he was fair. So the Brigadier said to Nicklin, Nick, back off. Let's restore some sensibility to the whole thing. So they did. Now, I don't mean that the discipline went out the window. It didn't. But it made a great deal more sense. In February 1945, it seemed that the European war was nearly over. The Allied armies had reached the Rhine. But here they halted, faced with the greatest river obstacle in Western Europe. If they could cross the Rhine, their war was won. The Allies planned the largest single airborne landing of the war, Operation Varsity. The objective in the Rhine was to cross the Rhine River for the final advance uh, through Germany. This was the final big push and, and battle of the war, and we were lucky to be taking part in it. We were to drop the manpower by division strength we're now talking 20,000, 30,000 men to drop them by parachute with the troops landing on the German side of the river and then hold the enemy in check until the troops came across the Rhine and joined up with us. When we were told where we were going into Germany, loud cheers, and when, when the guys heard daylight, 10 o'clock in the morning, there was another cheer went up and somebody said to me, we're not gonna have another Normandy. As the attack gets underway, at an airfield in England, men of the 1st Canadian Parachute Regiment in plane. They join their British bodies of the 6th Airborne Division and their cousins of the 17th U.S. Airborne Div in the mightiest air invasion in history. Veterans of D-Day fly to the Grand Assault. The aircraft flew at the required level of about 850 feet, 900 feet. The Air Force guys, they were not happy about daylight drops of paratroopers because of the level. If you're on the ground as an enemy, that's a big target that's there. So a lot of aircraft were hit. The plane I was on was hit by, um, by flak and uh, caught fire. It was a very steep dive, and I had to climb up very quickly. And as I was getting out, and as soon as my plane, uh, my, my chute opened, I looked back and saw the, the crew coming out after me, and they all got killed because um, I saw them bounce on the ground. It was absolutely massive. It was the largest parachute drop in history. It'll never, of course, be repeated. Never in God's world. I could hear the zinging of the bullets, and you could see the, the holes in my chute where they, they had gone through. A German battalion was in the trees. They surrounded the field. They knew where we were going to land. They just didn't know what time of day we were coming in. Uh, so they were, they were ready for us. We were being fired at, there were several of us, but we didn't know where the bullets were coming from. 
at the end of the field, there's a white farmhouse. And I saw the farmer come running out and looking up at all of the parachutes that were dropping. And as I ran into the woods, I saw him run back into the house. He got in to get a shotgun, and he was shooting the guys that were in the trees. We formed up for an attack. Ready up, let's go. And so we just, all the men got up wherever they were, firing from the hip, attacking these various pillboxes and God knows what all, farmhouses, houses, whatever. And with the machine guns, grenades, and with the Bren guns that we had, uh, it, it made quick work. Of, and the Germ Germans just came out and surrendered by the dozens. They didn't fight much. They knew that uh, when you see our thousands of paratroopers coming down, so they were surrendering to us without any trouble at all. We come to this uh, plowed field, got into the bush, and Jeff Nicklin was still hanging up in the trees. He was killed. He dropped practically over top of a German emplacement who simply opened up on him, and that was it. It didn't take very long at all. We saw a movement under this big tree, about this big around. And uh, here, a German tried to surrender. Somebody behind me shot him. I don't know who it was. And uh, I guess he figured that it was him that killed Nicklin. After a few days, General Ridgway, who commanded the Allied Airborne Army, crossing the Rhine, he had word from Eisenhower that Stalin, the Russians, advancing from the east, were not going to adhere to an agreed line. They were going to move further into the western zone, ignoring any barriers that had been agreed on. So Bridgeway went to Brigadier Hill. He said, I've got to have a force moving fast as hell, nonstop, to get north to halt the Russians. And Hill said, I've got just the outfit that can do that. And they're Canadians. They are cowboys like you wouldn't believe. If anybody can do it, they can do it. So I'm going to put them on tanks, and we'll go like hell. Men of the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion forge ahead into Germany. Riding on British tanks, the force strikes out in a general northeasterly direction. Their goal is the German North Sea port. We were ordered to go night and day to Wiesmoor and get there before the Russians. But on the way up, if you were fired upon, you jumped off the tanks and cleared it out and got back on the tanks again. But the Germans were running there. They were hard to keep up to. You knew something was up because you were not getting the heavy fighting or anything, real, you know. Something was going on. And uh, to, to us, we thought, maybe the war is getting over, you know. I was on the lead tank. Suddenly, we're seeing this barbed wire enclosure on our right. I can remember it vividly because I have nightmares about it today. This barbed wire enclosure with guard towers. I had never seen anything like this before. Suddenly the tank I'm on came to an absolute halt because people came flooding, pri not prisoners, victims of the Holocaust came out of the camp and threw themselves in front of the tank and at the side of the tank just clutching and screaming, you know. They were the most emaciated, they, they were skeletons. Some of them were just crawling. I can remember seeing one man 
come out stumbling out of the gate and he was no no skin on him at all and he fell and he was crawling you know and i'm still sitting on this tank and i said get off give these people a hand you know find out what they are and then somebody came along and said this is a concentration camp it was bergen belson concentration camp did you see bergen belson yes is that I, I hate to even talk about it. It's just bones and skin and piled up like you see. When t somebody tells me about the Holocaust, they don't believe in it. I feel like. The medical officer came up and said to me, "We've got to get. We've got to get." some divisional help up here real fast. So move your tank, get your tank and this whole company, B Company, and get moving. I just remember going by it in the middle of the night. I, I remember very clear it was about midnight and I could hear the moans and groans from the from the encampment, and I was informed at the time that it was, I didn't know it was Belson, I just knew it was a, a, um, a concentration camp. Once we were across the Elbe, we could sense that the German army was collapsing, surrendering by the, by the company on either side of the road, fully armed, but we couldn't stop to take the prisoner. They were filling the roads with their weapons still in their hands, were waving us on. Come on, get past me. As soon as they knew they were, they were gonna be facing the Russians, <laughs> they want no part of them. We were engulfed by hundreds of citizens German citizens carrying everything they owned, and they were frightened to death of the Russians who were massacring. That's what we could gather further up in the Eastern zone. They were massacring the Germans. The stories they were telling of the brutality that was going on was terrible. But somebody said to me, after I was getting pretty angry about it, they said, look at it from the other side. Those people have been, these Russians have been brutalized by the Germans. Their farms burned to the ground, their women and kids massacred. So their feeling about the Germans is more violent, is more retaliatory than ours, because we didn't have that at all. We arrived in Wiesmar on May the 2nd, uh, two hours before the Russians arrived. We quickly dug in there. We brought up a Churchill tank and put it all down. We got it into a ditch there with just the, the gun showing. And so we had a pretty substantial roadblock. Waited and waited and waited. Then the Russians come. They had tanks and everything. One of our men Sergeant Warnick, he could speak Russian, so he understood what they were saying. And they, the Russians said they had orders to go and take the town from us. And they were going to go through our division to do it. It was a major, I don't know, some big wig from the Russians. They kept going in a car, trying to get through. And we took. So. He started to go ahead, so I said, fire burst over his head with a machine gun. They did, he turned around, go back. He went back and uh, would let him in. We were there to hold him back. If they had fired on us, we would have fired on them, and it would have been Third World War right there. So finally, on day four, our company sergeant major came up to the barricade where we where my platoon was and he said we've got to have a patrol go in 
into the Russian zone and make some contact in there at a higher level. We took an interpreter, a young lad by the name of Dyok. He was a Polish kid from the prairies. And we went in about 20 miles, and we were finally sent to a headquarters off to the right, just off the main highway. And out came a bunch of Ger Russian officers, beautifully dressed. And this one fellow with breeches and one thing, another, he looked about 21 years old, but he was a full general. <laughs> he said, come in, come in. They had a big table set up with some finger food, but the main thing on the table was great jugs of vodka, tremendous jugs of vodka. And of course, you know, Winston Churchill, they knew that. They could, Winston Churchill, okay, Winston Churchill, great, great. You know, now that meant Marshall Stalin, Marshall Stalin. And it went down, you know, President Roosevelt and Eisenhower, uh, Zhukov. I couldn't drink anymore. It ended up I had to drive back. Pete couldn't drive. He was too far gone. We would go back to our headquarters and report to our general that there's peace. <laughs> so it was friendly from then on. Yes, we did socialize with them, <laughs> perhaps to excess, I'm afraid, because for us, the war was over. We were the first active battalion from the war zone, from actually from Germany, to arrive back in Canada. So everybody wanted a piece of us. The city had a prepared a, a parade up Bay Street to a welcome at City Hall, which nobody had ever experienced before. My mother and father were both there, and they were very tearful. It was heartwarming, it really was. It was great to be home. I just looked at my dad and my mother, and I said, hi, Dad, I made it. That was it. Sometimes it just hits you like a ton of brick. But, uh, Life goes on. The thing is that with the paratroopers, you look after each other. You can't describe it, it's just one of those things. To this day, we're still airborne. And I, you know, and I'm proud that I'm airborne. If I was a young fellow today, I, that's where I'd be, jumping. 